Hey, Writing Pursuits authors, welcome back to the podcast. If you're new around here, my name is Catrice McKee, and I'm glad you're here. Today, we're going to continue our world building series. Uh, this is the third part of a six-part series on world building, and uh, it is called Society's Rules, Bend Them, Break Them. In our world building series, we are considering the ways world building can act as a source for theme, plot point, and best of all, conflict. This is part three of the series, and I think it's the most important piece of world building. When we think of world building, we tend to think of the physical aspects of the world, you know, the environment or the technology or, like I said, the physical aspects, the buildings and so forth. We don't think of society's rules as much as we ought to, but I think this is a treasure trove of conflict ideas and plot points, and themes. So of all the pieces, I think this is the part you need to think about the very most, and perhaps first. We have already been through building believable worlds and why it matters. We've also covered nature's realm, set the stage. Today is society's rules, bend them, break them. And then we will follow that up with wheels of progress, shape their, shape your world, past and present, um, where we explore history's legacy, and finally, magic, myth, and man wield the supernatural power. I'm looking forward to that one. Today in part three, we will cover these important considerations, social class, cultural norms, uh, form of government, distribution of wealth, prevailing religion, moral codes, rights and responsibilities, and laws of magic. And if that seems like a lot, it is. This is a complex topic. I'm going to try to break it down and make it visible to you so that you can kind of go back through and find the chapter that you're wanting to talk about and uh, delve down into that. So hopefully uh, that will be helpful. The first thing we're going to discuss is social class. I will switch back and forth between mind, uh, mind map I have in Obsidian and this Canva presentation. So let's go to Obsidian right now. Okay. When you think about social class, your main question is how does society measure individual worth? And traditionally, we are, have these three systems in play. Sometimes they coexist um, and uh, other times they're very much dependent on where you're talking about. Hierarchy, egalitarian societies, egalitarian societies, and the caste system. So some examples of hierarchy that are very clear are the military, business, you have org charts there, there's always someone at the top, political systems, the same, uh, and churches. Almost every religious organization has some form of hierarchy. Um, there are a few, there are a few examples of pure egalitarian societies, but if you're interested in portraying something like that, uh, look into the Kung who live on the western edge of the Kalahari in Botswana, the Inuit, and Aboriginal Australians as good examples of egalitarian societies. Um, there are caste systems still in play today, and uh, some of these are stronger than others, but uh, caste system is very much based on who you are born to, which family you are born into. Examples are the Varnas in India, a Tamil, a Tamil caste in Sri Lanka, Somali Higal, Moorish caste, the Tuareg Inadin in North Africa, and Edo Society of Japan. So some of these are historical, some of them are current, um, but that's a good place to start if you're wanting to uh, talk about caste system. I have a little bit more information about caste systems, just the, the features that you should be looking for. In the caste system, you have these fairy, uh, these features. You will only marry within your assigned caste. You will do the assigned jobs for your caste. Those are expectations in the caste system. Uh, your social status will be determined by the caste you're born into. Political exclusion of certain castes is a feature of the caste system. And there is a lot of caste-based discrimination in play. So this is a great place to bend and break society's rules, create conflict, to explore themes, and to develop plot points. So um, I I think that the caste system is a great place uh, perhaps to have in your your story. Just think about that as a, as a possibility. Next is cultural norm. Now, Culture encompasses the customs, art, social institutions, and achievements of a particular nation, a people, or other social group. So often you need to know the historical context too. We'll talk more about that in part five of this series. In your book, Society, there are customs and holidays and expectations about dress and roles, arts and achievements 
that are all pieces of the culture. So I have three examples that I'd like to just go over. They just popped into my head when I was thinking about this. And um, they're about cultural norms and breaking cultural norms. And ever after, the main character is Danielle de Barbarak and uh, a ca character based on Cinderella for anyone who has not seen the movie. In the movie, Danielle breaks several of society's rules. She is a commoner. Danielle is not allowed to attend royal events such as the masquerade ball. She sneaks into the ball, breaking the rules of social class and etiquette. Daniel's stepmother, who is part of the aristocracy, forbids her from pursuing an education as she believes it's not appropriate for a woman. But Danielle secretly studies books from her father's library to learn all she can. Danielle's stepmother forces her to work as a servant in her own home and treats her cruelly. Despite her lowly status, Danielle stands up to her stepmother, breaking the societal ex societal expectations for a commoner. And overall, Danielle is a strong-willed and independent character who defies the limitations placed on her by society. Her actions tra challenge the traditional gender roles and the social hierarchies of the time. So that's one example. Another example is uh, the Collins from the Twilight series. The Collins are a family of vampires and their way of life goes against the rules of vampire society. So you don't even have to have a real society to have social rules that are going to get broken. They choose to abstain from drinking human blood and instead hunt animals. Well, you know, the Collins do not form a coven, but they live as a family group. Um, they don't use their powers to hunt humans. So they seem strange to vampire society. And then they form alliances with humans and even protect them um a portrayal to other vampires so the colons live in a small isolated town the majority of other vampires live close to urban environments where there's easy hunting right and then overall basically the colons break traditional rules of vampire society to live a more moral and ethical lifestyle than other vampires and their choices bring them into conflict with other vampires who see their betrayal as other behavior as a betrayal or a threat to the established order of things. So <laughs> that was one example. Another example that I love is uh, Star Trek from the 1960s. Fictional world of uh, Star Trek, the Federation is an interstellar political entity uh, comprised of lots of races and species united like by a common set of values and beliefs. So their cultural values, uh, the, number one is the prime directive, right? Which prohibits interference with the internal affairs of other civilizations and cultures that they run into while they're out exploring space. Equality among all individuals, regardless of race, gender, or species. Um, cooperation among its members as they work for the common good of all. So these are their values. Uh, scientific progress, that's all, what they're all about, right? It's a pursuit of scientific progress, pursuit of knowledge and understanding of the universe, and a supposedly peaceful resolution of conflict where diplomacy comes first, and then you get out the guns. Well, anyway, it always seems like somebody gets killed in every episode, and they usually have a red shirt. But regardless, they used uh, the the rules of this the society to drive conflict within the series and storylines and um, themes. So uh, good on them. Uh, so the next topic that we're going to cover is form of government. Form of government, and we'll go back over to Obsidian because I think a chart is easier to understand than just a collection of pictures. Going over to Obsidian now. So the form of government. It's about who makes decisions and how they make it. So we're all familiar with uh, monarchies. We grew up with those in our fairy tales. And they used to be a reality um, around, especially around Europe and Asia. And uh, so uh, those grew into limited uh, monarchies where you have more advisors and legislative bodies that formed to uh, kind of take over power from the monarch and give more people, more power to the people, or at least to the aristocracy. Yeah. Anyway, um, then you have autocracies um, that uh, obviously like um, Putin in in Russia and uh, the leader of North Korea. And there's several that we could just name off. Um, then you have theocracies where the dominant uh, religion, religious leaders lead the country. Elected democracy is another form that we have in the world appointed. Sometimes leaders and, and governments are appointed in some form or fashion. And then you think have to think about the presence of a bureaucracy uh, because often power is in the hands of 
people who are in the bureaucracy. This kind of exploded onto the scene after the French Revolution. There was a, an explosion of bureaucracy in that country, and it was intentional to decide everything from weights and measures to the postal system. So in some ways, it's a good thing. In some ways, it's not so great. We all hope for a meritocracy where uh, people are promoted based on their knowledge and their wisdom and their skills and their talents. We all hope for that. But, you know, we all have the, what is it, the Peter principle in play where you rise to the level of your incompetence. Eh. Anyway, and finally, we have plutocracy, which we wish wasn't true, but is probably more true than the not, where people with the, the wealth have the power. They make the decisions behind the scenes. So plutocracy, that's what that means. So think about that in the context of your story. What exists in your universe? And you might have two things working against each other to create conflict or people trying to improve the system that exists to make it better against people that want the status quo. So this is a great area to explore for society's rules. The next topic is distribution of wealth. Who can have wealth and who cannot? This is something to really explore in your fiction. So distribution of wealth is about who can increase their wealth and who cannot, the haves, the have nots. Generally under the haves, you have the aristocracy, the merchant class, celebrities, those who are gifted, master criminals. These kind of, the celebrities and gifted kind of buck the system, if you will. Uh, they manage to, by hook or crook, develop, develop some sort of celebrity that people think is worthy of wealth. The gifted, same thing. Master criminals like pirates, drug lords, and so forth. They just take what they want. Uh, so they're among the haves, whether we like it or not. And then under the have-nots, generally it's about ownership of land to begin with. Uh, that leads to all kinds of generational wealth. So we have the uneducated who are under the have-nots, the disadvantaged in some way, who've uh, been discriminated against, enslaved folk. Believe it or not, even in contemporary fiction, you should be aware that there are more people who are enslaved today than at any point in history. So that's worthy of being explored. Uh, exploited people and renters who might also be exploited people, right? Uh, but renters are among the have-nots. They don't own the space they live in. Now, they may be able to accumulate wealth in another way, and that's fine. You can choose to be a renter. I'm not, nothing against renters, but I'm just saying, in general, renters are among the have-nots. So there we go, without trying to step on any toes. <laughs> this is a great place to think about uh Bending rules, breaking rules. Hey, if you're finding any value in this discussion, um, please subscribe, uh, hit the like button, ring the bell to get notified of future episodes, and we'll get back to the show now. The next topic is prevailing religion or religions in your world. The prevailing religion or religions in your world building offer a rich source of conflict for your story. Most conflicts over the course of human history have had some overtone of religious tension, biases, and misunderstandings. Religion is a great place to delve into themes and conflict between characters. Humans often use religion as an excuse for violence and hatred, consider the prevailing religions in your fictional world and see if you can mine their differences for plot point themes and sources of conflict. And just to be clear, let's go over a few things you can think about, a few types of religion you can think about. Maybe when I mentioned prevailing religion, you thought of polytheistic or monotheistic form of religion, but there are others. So in polytheistic, we have a mini god system, as in the Romans and the Greeks, uh, their mythology um, with Zeus and so forth. Uh, monotheistic, one God. Um, atheistic, no gods. Nothing is divine. Um, pantheistic, and I put that under religious because uh, it's hard not to, because uh, you're talking about the existence of God or not. Pantheistic, God is everything and everything is God. Everything is divine. And panentheistic is all in God. So think about differing religious systems, prevailing religions in your story to have a source of conflict and thought-provoking ideas. The next area to consider are moral codes. 
Moral codes seem like an extension of religious beliefs, and sometimes they are, but don't equate the two. Moral codes apply even to irreligious folks. So let's explore how we can use this portion of society's rules. How can we bend moral codes or break them to good effect in our stories? So when we think about moral codes, we're talking about how do we decide between right and wrong and how do we pr promote cooperation good and bad behavior. So there are four areas of morality. There's religious morality, which is the one you think of first, human relationship with your supernatural beings, the God, morality and nature, how we uh, treat nature around us, whether we think it's worthy of respect or not, um, individual morality, humans inner honor code, which can often be broken within a story. Um, somebody goes against their uh, internal honor code or they learn a new honor code. Um, so, so social morality, human to human relations. So under basic morality examples, honesty, respect, responsibility, kindness, caring, cooperation, fairness, etc. Examples of social morality might be help your family, help your group, return favors, be brave, defer to superiors, divide resources fairly, respect others' property. So these are all ways that um, are, are examples of social morality and whether or not people believe these things. So great area to think about when you're thinking about society's rules. The next area we're going to talk about is rights and responsibilities. I'm about to cover a set of pie in the sky, by and by human rights. They obviously don't exist in this form everywhere in the world. Sometimes they exist for a while and then they go away. Uh, it's a constant struggle among humans to have human rights. They are idealistic. I did not write them. Instead, I found them on the Elomis website, which is included in the show notes if you want to delve into that. The reason I'm going over these ideals is because they're a terrific source for themes for your story. So under rights and responsibilities uh, comes this first ideal that humans are born free and equal. That's a birthright. Uh, another idealistic right is there are no distinctions of rights and freedoms based on things like race, sex, language, religion, origin, property, birth, or other status. So in any one of these areas, you could explore a theme based on like discrimination based on any one of these things. Uh, the next ideal was everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of purpose person. In other words, personal safety. Um, another one is no one should be held in slavery or servitude. Well, obviously we haven't achieved this one because like I said before, this is a, an era of great enslavement, horrible enslavement. So it's obviously an opportunity to explore this area. No one should be tortured or subjected to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Again, obviously we haven't achieved this ideal. And and this is a great place to explore no matter what kind of um, genre of fiction you're talking about. All are equal before the law and entitled to equal protection. So those are the ideals. I wanted to just flash them by you. You can come back to this chapter to reinvestigate. The last part of social society's rules are the laws of magic. Today we're going to skim lightly over the topic of laws of magic because we're going to explore this area more fully in the last episode in this world building series. However, let's cover the basics to help you jumpstart ways to exploit magic systems in your book for plot points and conflict and to support your theme. So when you're thinking about the laws of magic, is your magic benevolent, malevolent? Usually there's both good and bad. There's almost always a dichotomy, good and bad magic. You also have to think is magic legal or illegal? in your world building. Who has magic and how does it work? This is a big thing to decide. And I'm just going to start you off with something I borrowed from Brandon Sanderson. Um, the link to the article that contained this is in the show notes. What are Sanderson's three laws of magic? So let's begin with a summary. The three laws are an author's ability to solve conflict with magic in a satisfying way is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. So make your magic system crystal clear to your readers. They need to know kind of how it works or not all at front, but be able to discover it and understand it. Uh, the costs, limitations, and flaws described in your story are about are what make your magic inter interesting. So not all magic is going to be perfect. It's going to be an imperfect solution. Hopefully there's limitations to it. Also, I think there needs to be cost associated with using magic. 
because that in itself make things more interesting. Um, before adding something new to your system, first expand on what you had have. That's that's by a master storyteller. Brandon Satterson has been writing long time, and I think this is great advice. Before you add anything new, expand on what you already have. All right. So in conclusion, leveraging the rules of society and world building is a powerful tool for creating a more compelling and engaging story. You can create conflict, tension, and drama with characters who have conflicting beliefs or values based on their social status, their culture, or background. You can shape character motivation. A character who is trying to break free from a restrictive society may be motivated by a desire for freedom and self-expression. You can establish stake. A character who breaks a major societal rule faces severe consequences and even possible death. So that's a great way to establish stakes in your story. Build setting. An author can create a unique and interesting setting by developing a society with its own set of rules and custom. This will in turn influence the physical setting. So think about that when you're when you're creating your society's rules. Explore themes. Um, sure, society's rules are useful to explore themes such as oppression, rebellion, conformity, and so on. So that rounds up this episode about society's rules in world building. Today in part three, we have discussed social class, form of government, the cultural norms, distribution of wealth, prevailing religion, moral codes, rights and responsibilities, and the laws of magic. My question for you is which one of these areas speaks to you and how have you used society's rules as important as important aspects in your story? Uh, leave your answers in the comments below. If you want to name drop a book title, that's okay too. So that's all I have for today. Until next time, keep writing my friend. Keep writing.